being here and leading with us every week. It's great to sit here and listen to him. I don't know what to do when I don't have the choir behind me. I'm sitting over here with April and Paula. I said, where am I supposed to be? What am I supposed to be doing? Uh, I'm glad that you're with us here in whatever the routine is in the middle of July. Uh, will you stand with us and let's sing some songs of testimony. We sang that he came and he lifted me. And because of that, we can continue in our worship. Sing with me. In loving kindness, Jesus came, my soul in mercy to reclaim. And from the depths of sin and shame, through grace he lifted me. From sinking sand, he lifted me with tender hand. He Forgive me, lifted me. From sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night to plains of light. Oh, praise his name, he lifted me. Now on a higher plane I dwell, and with my
and that is to worship you. Unplug us, O oh God, from distractions, worries, anxieties, concerns, responsibilities. For surely in this bit of time, we can breathe deeply and belong to you and know that everything else will wait. And those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Amen. Stand up. <laughs> there are people that live with 10 people, and when you come to church, you're not lonely a bit for fellowship because you had to rent a minivan to get here, all right? Other people live alone or with the same old, same old, right? And they look forward to seeing your smile when you come into this place. And so I'm just going to invite you around and just turn around and tell somebody good morning nearby. I look forward to seeing your smile every Sunday. Good morning. Good morning. And good morning, brother.
faithfulness in the past and to come. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, of faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven that you do just what you say. Though the storms may i 
in the back of the pew rack in front of you there's a connect card and if you'll give us a little information we'll be back in touch with you in the days ahead as to how our lives and your lives might intersect on the path that God has you on we'd love to know that you're with us it's that time of year where people PCS I encourage our congregation to consider your business to invite people to church you know you, you, you see the moving van I mean it's very conspicuous all day long the, the, the truck parked in the middle of the street make some cookies smile and go over and invite them to church all right? worst thing that happens they say we don't like cookies you go home and eat the cookies right I mean you know that, that oh, it could go wrong uh, I also want to say that our deacon of the week is Jeff Carrera and I, I, Jeff's a very humble and, and modest servant of the Lord but I got to tell you that Jeff has a heart for three different groups the the people that he comes from are beautiful people the people he's with now are beautiful people and the people he dreams of being with are the philippines and i just want to tell you that he is a missionary to the philippines he's just stuck here with us during covid all right and and i just want to tell you that jeff's heart is in the philippines and his heart is with us i want to say that if if you are ever wondering how just a little bit of money and prayer and effort could make a difference Talk to Jeff about the Philippines. He, he can tell you that $1,000 could make a difference in a whole church's existence. And a few thousand dollars could birth the church. He could tell you that, that kids could be fed, hungry kids could be fed at the local church if they just had the resources. I'm not up here talk, asking you for money. I'm telling you that there are people in our church that invest themselves in faraway places we don't even know about it on a regular basis. And Because Jeff has never asked you for money one time. And he's never bragged about what he does in the Philippines. But I've got to do this. During COVID, he and others in this church were discipling people in the Philippines using modern technology. And when they couldn't go, they still went. And I love that attitude. This guy, Jeff, you, you have the energy of a 20-year-old. You, you have the heart and, and, and the wisdom of a 100-year-old, right? And I just love you, man, right? I'm proud of my deacons, all of them, and I'm proud of this deacon. Jeff, come voice our prayer this morning, if you would. After you hear those words, I can hardly hold my cry. Brothers, you have been very instrumental in our life as missionaries. Every one of you have put in the work God calls us to do, and we are very thankful for that. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, every one of you. I just want to read one word. I'm not going to preach. Don't worry about it. So you be calm. In Proverbs 1, 5, there's a word that I want to invite us to meditate on it. Most of us are used to the meditation of the word. So let's do that one today and the rest of the week. It says, let the wise listen and add to their, understand, their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. This word is stuck in my heart because today we're going to listen to the word of God spoken through his servant. And I want all of us to listen careful. The Lord is going to speak to every one of us in a special way. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you for bringing us today to hear what you had to say to us. Help us, Father, to have a fertile heart, mind, and disposition for you were to grow in us and be able to touch others. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. And we pray, Father, now the blessings to everyone who is going to return and contribute to what 
you have us doing in this ministry, Father, and this church that has reached out to too many people, Father. Bless everyone, Father. Thank you so much, and we ask you all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Thank you, Billy. Thank you. The Jesus Revolution, as I was reading and preparing this week, I was thinking a little bit about the contrast between a rebellion and a revolution and how some perceived Christ as leading a rebellion but on many times Jesus had the chance to really lead a wholesale rebellion and yet he was leading a revolution I was thinking about the rebellion when they asked Jesus about paying taxes the time to start a rebellion would have been for him to say Jewish people should not send Caesar any more money because Caesar is pagan and Caesar has nothing to offer us he is the oppressor and we're not giving him any more money that would have started what a rebellion and when asked about the law Jesus said I I came to fulfill the law I didn't come to, to, to throw it out. I came to build on it. You say, I, I came to throw the law out. See, that would have been a rebellion. But Jesus was starting a revolution. And it wasn't a political revolution. A spiritual revolution. I was thinking a little bit about the industrial rev- revolution in American history and really in, in the history of worldwide. The steam engine allowed factories to exist and to do things that couldn't have been done previously because they didn't have a source of power a long time ago they had to build sawmills and grist mills next to flowing water and if you're going to put in a grist mill or sawmill you dammed up the river or the stream enough so they could divert water and the water would turn a wheel and the water wheel was the actual source of power for then whatever geared machinery that they wanted to step up and bring about a sawmill or a gristmill. Now the Industrial Revolution didn't outlaw water wheels. The Industrial Revolution simply said we can build a factory anywhere we have what? Coal and a steam engine and water. And the Industrial Revolution brought on all sorts of machinery that could run off of that power. And Jesus came as a revolutionary. He didn't say that you can't do this old stuff anymore, but it just kind of became less and less relevant when a new power source was available. I think sometime we we, kind of get in our way and we want to do it a certain way, we want to think a certain way, and Jesus says, you know, new thought, new opportunity, new day speak about that a little more the main thing I want to say here is the the Jesus revolution should be forever taking place in our life God is not stagnant our relationship with the Lord should not be stagnant behold a a new day that the the day becomes opportunity and every opportunity is a new opportunity that comes to us by way of the Lord an opportunity for there to be more of Christ and less of us in that given day If you have your Bible with you today, I'm going to be in Mark chapter 2 and chapter 3. Kind of a flowing series of events here that all tie together like this. Mark chapter 2 beginning with verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not fasting? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast when he is with them? They cannot so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And the one who pours new wine into old wineskins, if he does this, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and as his disciples walked along, some began to pick some of the heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? short answer he was said 
because they're hungry? That had been the short answer. He answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and he ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priest to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to him, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man had a shriveled hand and he was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save a life or to kill, but they remained silent. He looked at them and angry. He looked around them. Verse 5. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. He said to them, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Ouch. And I read this passage and I see Jesus coming to fulfill the law the first thing he encounters here is the fasting now understand Jesus never said don't fast as a matter of fact he said to his followers when you pray do it this way when you give do it this way when you fast do it this way now I know in our American comfort we think that fasting is awfully antiquated but some of us could use a little of it and the idea of fasting is that we make our I saw, I saw this in a gymnasium, so I'm going to give somebody else credit for it if it offends you. All right? In the gymnasium, the, the, the thing on the wall said, make your body your slave. Okay? The idea that our will is stronger than what our body says. And I cannot drive by Dairy Queen without hearing banana split from my taste buds, from my body, right? but I don't have to banana split because what? I, I make my body my slave. I tell my body yes or no. So I wait till I get home and make a Dr. Pepper float because that's better. <laughs> he didn't say no to fasting. He simply said it's not the time to fast because I'm here with you. We're in the celebration phase. We're not in the grieving, mourning, recovery. You can talk to me. You don't have to seek somebody far away. And my two points there, if you've got a a place in your bulletin, write this down or you're taking notes. The revolution was replacing ritual with relationship. Ritual would be for me to declare as pastor at First Baptist Church, we're going to fast 12 hours every Friday. If you're going to be in good standing in the church, and if you want to be in good standing with the pastor every Friday from this time to this time, we're going to fast. I don't know everything about Ramadan, but I know that it is a ritual. And Jesus said, instead of a, a ritual, how about a relationship? And so your, your pastor fasts when I feel like God's calling me into a fast. I don't tell anybody when that's going on. The way this works for me, I have a metabolism that allows me to skip meals. I can drink a glass of water and keep going, okay? So I'm not diabetic. I'm not, you know what I'm saying? I don't really get hangry that much. It just kind of, I know you've got to feed the thing like putting gas in a car. It runs out. But that's me. What works for me doesn't work for you. If you're a a, a diabetic, you need to definitely talk to your doctor. Four hours may be fasting for you. Works for me. It's to fast 24 hours. So I wake, I know the day before I'm going to fast. I get up in the morning, knowing that I'm fasting that day. I drink a lot of water because that kind of keeps my stomach from making noises at work. Use your lunch hour to pray and to read scripture in the evening, do some meditation, go to bed. The next morning, you guess what? Break fast. (laughs) All right works for me other people fast longer some people fast longer some people say I never fasted before but I I, I, 
you, you fast because it, your relationship, you have a hunger for God that he's drawn you into a time when your, your inner cravings are craving the Lord more than food and you want to set aside in that discipline and honor the Lord in your life. Ritual versus relationship. And someone says they're, they're Buddhist, and I say, do you have a relationship with Buddha? Someone tells me that they have a religion or even a Christian version of religion that is very, very ritual. And I say, do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? And a relationship with God. Do you have a relationship with Muhammad? Whatever word for deity they espouse to respect, very few say, I have a relationship with them. Some of them would say it would would be scornful and offensive to suggest that I could have a relationship with them. A relationship with Jesus Christ. She says, I'm with you right here, right now. It's not the time to get caught up in ritual. It's the time to celebrate the relationship. The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is with humanity for this small amount of time and all they can see is the potential that he might, that he just might break a rule. (laughs) Because their whole mission was what? The enforcement of the rules. And their power over the people and their justification for existing was enforcement of the rules. It's how they justified their existence on planet Earth was rule keeping. And Christ came to fulfill the law, the establishment of ritual, to say this ritual was supposed to be plugging you back in. They were supposed to be fasting to the Father. A, a connection with him, not just fasting to connect with what? History, rules, and regulation. Secondly, he came replacing familiarity with flexibility. Familiarity. Familiarity. I, I tell you this before you come to church today, you've got an idea of what's going to happen. Now, Reef can tweak the order of service a little bit. We can pray and sing or sing and pray, but I guarantee you that if we neither sang or neither pray, somebody go, that wasn't church. I don't even recognize it. Some of the worship novices that experiment with freshening things up, they'll, they'll do a worship in the round where the whole congregation is seated in the round and, 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 and there's not a leader, it just, it just happens. I was at a funeral for a friend of mine from high school and it was a different culture group than the group I grew up in, all right, Be, meaning Southern Baptist. Right? No one led the singing, but they sang for about an hour. Somebody over here would just start to sing out of their heart, and people, they were familiar songs, and it just kind of picked up, and it flowed for a while, and then it died off, and then it might be quiet, and then somebody else would sing. And some of y'all would have hated it because there's no printed order of worship. And some of you would have loved it. You say, finally, the chains are off and we can be spirit led. Christ came and talked about putting new wine into old wine skin. And never mind, never mind how you feel about wine. He said, if you put a, a, if you, if you put a patch, the, the, a non shrunk patch, if you put a patch on it, then the patch is going to shrink and it's going to deform the whole thing. You can't put a, a, a new patch on an old thing. And he says there's a revolution taking place. There's something new is coming up here. Now, I'm not going to suggest that every time we need to start a new church or a new movement that we need to throw out everything that we know to be good. I hope every new church that a Baptist church starts is a Baptist church in doctrine and teaching and soteriology and who is God, who is Jesus, all those things. But it, 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 my, my country church back in East Texas had a hard time with church in the wind. Church in the Wind was a biker church. Well, where did they meet? Wherever they wanted to. Well, when did they meet? Whenever they met. Well, that's not a church. Well, there was a reason that 
Church in the Wind was never going to be understood by First Baptist Church because it was a new thing. If they preach Jesus, if they've got good doctrine, it's at least a Christian organism, whether you say that's a church. Because if you don't have a steeple, you're not a church, right? There's a church in Fort Worth, and they work with seminary students on how to start urban churches without ever owning property. They said in big cities, property is too expensive. If you have to build a building to be a church, you're never going to reach your cities. And their whole paradigm, their whole design is how do you form churches in homes and then in rented space for worship in such a way that you never even aspire to own property. Now, I like owning property. I buy my house instead of renting it because I'm going to live in it 50 years and it's good stewardship to own the property. I have no problem with us owning property. But if we were in New York City, the thing might keep us from existing be the fact that we couldn't afford to buy a skyscraper to tear it down to put a steeple on that property. There should still be a church there. We shouldn't allow our familiarity to prevent our flexibility. Look at verse 21, what was going on. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wineskins. He says, I'm doing something new. I remember an elementary teacher voicing a prayer in the morning. I'm that old. People said, we can't do anymore, so we don't do that anymore. So we become mentally trained that we'll do church at church and they'll do school at school. And then somebody said, you know, if you can have a chess club and you can have a robotics club, could we have a Bible club? It's participation optional. It's an after-school thing. Could that happen? And somebody runs it by the Supreme Court, and they said, yeah, I guess you can. Something called equal access. I don't know. Hmm. So now we have an opportunity to teach children in an after-school Bible club. On every campus where we can find a sponsor and a team to do it. And we say we need volunteers for Bible club. You say, well, I'll teach at Sunday school. Do you understand that Sunday school was invented to teach illiterate children that were begging on the street during the weekdays? It was to teach them A, B, C's, how to be literate, and yes, of course, about Jesus Christ. Sunday school was meant to be a hybrid between school and, and Sunday. And we think of children's education in terms of Sunday morning. And now we have an opportunity for Tuesday afternoon. Well, I don't do church on Tuesday. Flexibility. To see an opportunity. And so COVID says no to go in the Philippines, but somebody says, can we Zoom them? And there's been a group this week working in Poland, but there's also a group working through Zoom in the Ukraine. There's been another group working, a small group working in the Ukraine sharing the gospel my friend Michael God on his 80th birthday preached Christ six times in the Ukraine and saw people saved what a, what a birthday gift to heaven amen he said well I can't do that well can I do that and too often in our tiredness when we're told no to something, we don't have the brightness to think, okay, the answer is no to that, but could I do this? Because the Great Commission is still the Great Commission. Replacing familiarity with flexibility. Some of y'all get nervous if I say, be flexible. Number one rule on a mission trip, they'll come in, they got a hold of you and said, but be flexible. You never know what's going to change. And, you know, there's just... It's reality. Replacing rules, number three, replacing rules with the ruler. 23 through 28. You're walking through the grain fields, gather up some grains. I, I'm imagining this, okay? Walking through the grain field, 
handful of grain, rub it like this, blow the chaff out, start chewing on it. This is like whole wheat bread without the bread, right? But it would, it would keep a guy alive. And they go, oh, there they go. They're working on the Sabbath. Rule versus the ruler. And Jesus says this profound thing. The, the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I guarantee you this afternoon I'm going to lay down the air conditioning and I'm going to take a nap. Should I take a nap on the Lord's Day? I'm not even going to pray about it. (laughs) I'm just going to do it. Rules versus the ruler. Now, in my Israel trip at the start of the summer, we were in Jerusalem during Pentecost. Now, Pentecost for us is the gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. And so if there's ever a time during the year that, that we're going to kind of rev it up a little bit and jump a pew and shout amen, it might be on Pentecost. But Pentecost is the celebration of the law. And at the Temple Mound, they had all-night reading all night dress up like for church and go to the wall all night long and listen to the readings and everybody who had Jewish wardrobe wore it and there's different groups within Judaism that follow different rabbis and the different rabbis and traditions tell them different things they do with their wardrobe and there's this one group Now, there's an Old Testament law that that says that you shouldn't shave your head above this bone right here. Now, there's a rabbi that says, well, you shouldn't shave below that bone. The hair, the top hair, they shave their face, but they don't cut their hair below this bone, which leaves the curly things hanging down on the sides. You've seen them in pictures. Now, they're not all doing that because it's an interpretation of an obscure scripture but they said okay well if you wouldn't cut above that bone certainly you wouldn't cut below that bone and so this, this part of your hair your sideburns they're just going to grow and grow, 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 grow there's another group that wear two hats to show respect for God now all the Jewish people when, the men when they go to the temple or you know the, the, they've got the little you know, the, you know what I'm talking about they all wear a hat because there should be something between them and God. They say, you know, God is above, and so we're going to show reverence to God by wearing something. But there's one group, they wear two hats because they're more reverent than everybody else. To which I think it's only a matter of time before there's a three-hat group. And this only ends when you have so many hats that they will no longer stack upon your head. I mean, anybody who's been to First Baptist Church knows there's a Second Baptist Church, right? I mean, these things do progress. One hatters, two hatters, three hatters. There's a group that have these awesome fur-looking hats that their tradition comes out of Europe 200, 250 years ago. And they, they, honestly, their hats look very Russian. Well, that's where they came from. And that's when their rabbi taught. And they wanted to wear a hat like the rabbi. But it froze them in time, stylistically. Rules versus the ruler. Modern technology allows us to re-watch whichever rewinds at home we want to watch. And at my house, if I need a little laugh, I'm going to pull up Andy Griffith. And then you know the real star is Barney Fife. There's an episode where Andy has to go to Mount Pilate for the day and he leaves... Barney in charge for the day one day and when Andy comes back to the to the courthouse jail everybody there's the streets are empty because Barney has arrested everybody (laughs) including little Opie and Aunt B they're all in the jail because as he went about a day, he could find an infraction. He could find an infraction if he, it, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the, yeah, when they started protesting, they were creating a riot. He, I mean, the whole group, the women's auxiliary from the church, they're all in there. It's like a clown car when they're all getting out as he started unloading them. They couldn't have possibly all been in there, but he just parades them all through. 
And in the name of the law, in the name of justice, Barney really blew it. Now, I used to think of Jewish people, and I'd say, well, they follow the Old Testament, we follow the New Testament, but modern Judaism is not just following the Old Testament, New Testament. That's, that would be more like Seventh-day Adventists today, a modern group that follows the Old Testament. But they followed the derivatives of the law, the evolution of the law. So you had the law that we would read in the Bible, and then they would have a rabbi's interpretation on and down and down and down and down. And those schools of thought had their disciples, and those group of disciples followed their rabbi and their rabbi's school of thought, which was an interpretation and a building on. The so they had hundreds of laws that we've never heard of. And Jesus said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And they were so mad. They were so mad. And they were so mad it made Jesus mad. Did you pick that up? There is a righteous indignation. And Jesus sensed that he could have been stoned that day. He said, is it lawful? to heal on the Sabbath or to kill and, and my interpretation is that Jesus was talking about killing him that, that, that he was talking about y'all thinking about killing me now on the Sabbath replacing the rules with the ruler interesting to me the only thing Jesus did to heal this man there are times where Jesus did things like spit in the mud uh, mi uh, spit in the dirt, mixed it up, put mud in his eyes. There's times where Jesus did things in the process of healing. But all Jesus said was extend your hand. And he was healed. He spoke way fewer words than the Sadducees and Sadducees and Herodians. They were, they were talking. I mean, you could talk on the Sabbath. But all Jesus would speak his words. And they were, wanted to condemn him for healing on the Sabbath. At the very suggestion that anything progressive, popular, or optional was done on that day and they missed the holiness and moment of God the, the beauty of the moment because they were busy being offended have you ever been busy being offended oh I did a, a whole wedding weekend from the rehearsal to the rehearsal dinner and the mother of the groom was offended in some way of not being consulted about the wedding proceedings my mother's so wise my mother's the mother of nine six sons my mother said the, the mother of the groom the mother of the groom has two jobs dress up and shut up. <laughs> that, that was my mom's. That just, I just throw that in for free. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's true, but <laughs> there's enough drama at a wedding without having extra drama at a wedding. And they're so busy being offended that they didn't enjoy their son's wedding. I wonder sometime if we're busy being offended. I came into the building. You were expecting one thing, but something else happened. Maybe somebody sat in your spot. We actually had our youth group go to another church for a Sunday night concert. They'd brought in a, an artist, and so our youth group went over there under invitation, came in, sat down, and church members came in and said, you're in our place, you'll need to move. I mean, it's one thing to think it, but it's another thing to say it. Placing the rules with the ruler. I know a minister had gotten in trouble. It was time for Wednesday night prayer meeting, but he wasn't there. Well, there was a person in crisis, and he took it upon himself to minister because he assumed that the adults in his church could pray whether he was there or not. Boy, that's a dangerous assumption, wasn't it? Rule 
devil's ruler. God help us if our religious rules ever separate us from the ruler. And then replacing reaction with rightness. Their first reaction was wrong. Have, have you ever been glad you didn't say what you were thinking? Yeah. Yeah. I've, n- I've never said this. I've never said this. I've never said this. I read it one time and somehow it got in my brain. And unless I develop a really bad dysfunction, I'll never say this. But the cartoon read like this. The wife is asking the husband, does this dress make me look fat? And his answer was, sweetheart, it's not the dress. <laughs> now, that was just a cartoon. Right? All right. Now, stay with me. I am so glad I've never said that. I I wish I'd never seen it. It's stuck in the back of my brain somewhere. I'm just saving it for some vacation week when I want to get hit, okay? It's just back there. Road rage. There are people in the state penitentiary that if if they could change three minutes of their life, they wouldn't be in the penitentiary just a moment that the the reaction is the wrong thing to say and replacing Jesus revolution reacting with rightness to take a thought and say what is God doing here what what might God be doing that I'm missing by the way sometimes we also need to ask what is, the, what is the evil one? What is Satan? What, what might the enemy do in here that I need to process appropriately? If we're going to go to war, we ought to go to war in a calculated fashion, not a reactive fashion. Replacing our reaction. Oh, I've been so glad sometime that I've held my tongue and not said what I was thinking inevitably under looking at I was making an assumption that was erroneous I didn't have all the facts my pride had been pricked or my anger or I wasn't in the spirit Mark 3 1 through 6 another time he went to the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him so closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. And he had the man with a shriveled hand stand up in front of everyone. And Jesus asked them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And they remained silent. He looked around them in anger deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts said to the man stretch out your hand he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus wow so I ask you is your instinct to defend or to forgive and Jesus brought this revolution to us that our preservation is not our highest agenda but to honor God in our life is our highest agenda is our instinct to withhold or to bless is our instinct to punish or to administer grace and I dare say even though it's 2022 and we've been saved since kindergarten that the Jesus revolution is still taking place in our life because still instinctively we battle the flesh and our own instincts to preserve what we are and what we know and what we have. How dare someone want what I have or ask for something. I've got a friend and he's a mess. He's a mess. 
can I borrow a car? My brakes are shot. I said, I'd really rather really not loan you a car, but I will get your brakes fixed. See, I, I know some good mechanics, and God's people love people, and here's a guy in a bind, and we know that in our church we have resources. He said, well, I, I'd love to do that. He said, but I, I don't have my car key. I said, why don't you have your car key? Well, I borrowed a friend's car. And my keys were in the car. And the car was stolen. So I don't have my car keys. I'm thinking, the last car you borrowed was stolen and you want to borrow mine. <laughs> and you'd borrowed your last car because you had driven your car into the ground, literally. So we're like, strike one, you trashed your car. Strike two, you borrowed one, it was stolen. Strike three, you want to borrow mine. I'm like, oh my. It's like, can I borrow your boat? I sunk mine. <laughs> oh, that reaction, right? I mean, that reaction. And yet to try to think, okay, I don't, I'm not going to do that, but what can I do? To say if you know if if you if you can I said you know if you can find a solution we'll back I want to help you get on your feet. Let, let me help you, but I can't help you the way. But but let me help you. Doing something right, even for somebody who's a mess. Maybe you need a revolution in your life. prayer goes like this dear God I need a revolution in my life I want a relationship with Jesus that changes how I think and how I live I choose the Jesus revolution oh we are stewards of so much aren't we do you remember the parable of steward one said, I entrust you with this, and you invested it. Good job. Now, I entrust you with this, and you doubled it. Good job. The one that hoarded it and hid it in the ground was rebuked. Because just holding on wasn't stewardship. Amen? Just holding on isn't stewardship. It's preservation, but not stewardship. A Jesus revelation.